Egypt on the edge. As the president marks his first year in office, Mohamed Morsi tells the nation he has made mistakes, but blamed what he called enemies of Egypt for the nation's problems. As he strives to hang on to his job, this is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Jane Dutton. Egypt's first freely elected president is marking his first year in office and facing a growing rebellion, calling for his resignation. Opponents charge that he has failed to fulfil promises of restoring security, improving the economy, sharing power and instituting social justice. Mohamed Morsi used a televised address to take stock of his first 12 months. He offered opponents a say in amending a disputed constitution and a forum to seek national reconciliation. He also admitted mistakes and took a hard line on unspecified enemies. I have made a lot of mistakes and have had some successes at the same time. That's a fact. Economic growth has been delayed and we must progress in this area. It requires political settlement and stability. In the past year, I've discovered that the country's institutions need dramatic reforms to achieve the revolution's goals. We must steer away from traditional solutions. It is no secret that our revolution has enemies. Abroad, there are those who realize what a free, strong and developed Egypt is capable of presenting for its people. And inside the country, there are those who think that they can turn the clock backwards to the corrupt, oppressive state it was before. It seems that there are some among us who cannot imagine living any other way. Shortly after his address, protesters attacked the Muslim Brotherhood's Freedom and Justice Party headquarters in northern Egypt. The building was ransacked and items set on fire. It's fueling concerns about mass demonstrations planned for this weekend as the country becomes increasingly and dangerously divided. With more now for Inside Story, here's Hoda Abdelhamid in Cairo. Many here would tell you that the timing of the speech was aimed at deflecting the opposition's momentum as the country heads towards June 30th. The president did strike a chord among many, especially when he did acknowledge that he has done mistakes. He tried to appeal to the youth, telling them that they had been by and large ignored over the past year and that that should change. He also praised the security forces and the role of the military, but he fell short of criticizing his own camp. He blamed all the violence on remnants of the former regime who want to take over the revolution of January 25th and the, th the thugs that they hire to destabilize the country. He did completely ignored uh, the violence in Sinai that many here say are caused by jihadist groups. He also completely uh, ignored condemning the uh, inciting rhetoric that some of his political allies, the ultra-conservative religious groups, use. So at the end of the day, it is is a mixed bag. The opposition is still firm on its position. It is still calling for him to, uh, to step down. What is not clear is how much did the president appeal to the Egyptians yesterday, especially to those who are sitting on the fence, those who still haven't made up their minds whether they should go down on June 30th and join the mass demonstrations or not. One of the groups that has tapped into the discontent caused by the economic crisis is Tamarod, which means rebellion in Arabic. And they're supporting calls for Mursi's resignation. Tamarod's goal is to collect signatures from the people to withdraw confidence from Mursi due to his failures politically, economically and socially, and after all the blood which has been spilt. He has proven that he can't achieve the goals of the revolution, so we have decided to establish a campaign to demand the withdrawal of confidence from Mursi. And we join now on the line by Mawa El Qadi from that very same group, the Tamarod movement. I'm sure that you echo the view that we've just heard there, but what is your response to Morsi's speech? It was, uh, it's just blah, 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 all I can say. And uh, we are on the same track, and they didn't change our mind. It, it, the speech was nothing but uh, just uh, words, and he was uh, between lines threatening us, and... Uh, he said, uh, 
said at the beginning of uh, his uh, starting as a president, he said, give me uh, 100 days and I will do this and that. And he didn't do anything. And it's now one year, really, sincere for the interest of Egypt. They are only interest for their own interest. And as we all know, they are an international organization. And all they care about is their interest not Egypt's interest, and they are uh, putting the country down. Well, how bad and, uh, is the uh, situation? Give us a sense of what it is that you experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Everything they are putting us down. Tourism, economy, everything is going down. Everything, if you come and see the streets, there is uh, no gas, uh, uh, everything, and the prices became crazy. And it's getting worse and worse every day. Our demand that uh, he must leave and he will be prosecuted. And uh, we are going to start a national salvation government to save the country from going down. OK, Mawa, thank you very much for taking the time out to talk to us. Well, let's bring in our other guests, both of them in Cairo. Nada Omran is a co-founder of the Freedom and Justice Party. Angus Blair, founder of the Signet Institute, which specializes in economics, business and politics in the Middle East and North Africa. Nada Omran, what was the point of Morsi's speech? I think the main point that uh, Morsi, uh, President Morsi uh, made yesterday is that he showed everybody it was the first time for a president of Egypt to uh, uh, present like a statement of what he's done and what, what, what were his mistakes of the first year uh, in power. This is first and also to show his accomplishments. This is one thing. The second thing is that he was so clear showing what are the real problems and the real uh, reasons behind the problems people are facing in the street because most people said why doesn't he show up and just tell us what's going on and what are the reasons so I think last night he was so clear and he gave a full image of what's happening in Egypt uh, either on the ground or politically or security wise so I think it was really really uh, clear and uh, very important significant one. Angus do you agree with that that it was very clear what the president said, I mean, he took two and a half hours to deliver this message. I mean, that usually means you've got a lot to tell or nothing at all. What's your thinking on that? Yeah, I think uh, having been a year in office, if, uh, if the president wants to report to the populace, it would probably be wise if I give any recommendation to do so on a reg more regular basis. It's highly unusual that any leader in the world would make a speech for two and a half hours. I'm British and my prime minister, quite frankly, if he made a speech for two and a half hours would the following day probably wouldn't be in his position as head of the Conservative Party. I mean, that, that being said, the president came up with a number of issues. First, he apologised for some mistakes. That's pretty good to actually come up and say that you ha and admit that you've made mistakes. I think in other elements of it, though, there were some contradictions, a lot of mixed messaging, uh, contradictions, if I give the example of the IMF, where he said Egypt didn't want to uh, go in a, like a begging bowl to the international community, but then later said the IMF was, alone was necessary. Uh, the other issue I thought is naming names in the speech was probably uh, highly ill-advised, uh, almost slanderous, I would think, but that's for other people to determine. But the issue is Egypt has a lot of economic problems and social problems, and the fact is it would also have been good to come up with some ideas as to uh, what would be done about it, because the president's been in power for a year. It would, it would have been really good to come up with some examples of how to, uh, he would be advising his government or recommending to grow the economy faster. And uh, he's now bringing in younger people into government. Not yet, but it would have been good to have seen signs of that already. Because when I see many young people across Egypt, and in fact across the whole region, they're incredibly talented. And I don't like seeing young talent being wasted. When you see lots of young startups with lots of really good ideas from young people, men and women across the whole region, I think that's a shame. But it's a good idea to do it. I think it's a shame that it's taken a year to come to that conclusion. All right, I'm going to pick up on two points that you made there and ask Nada about it. The economy, we'll, we'll get back to that. But what Angus was saying there about how he picked on former regime figures, I mean, he mentioned them by name, Safat al-Sharif, Zakaria Azmi and Ahmed Shafiq. Why would he accuse these men of being behind 
those trying to unseat him. Why would he make such slanderous comments in public? I think people, I think he something like answered uh, what people want because people for the past some months ask him, always ask him and urge him to uh, declare names. Even uh, yesterday, last night, I was uh, in the hall listening to the speech and I heard so many of the audience saying, please mention names, say who are they, name the corrupts, name who are behind. Doesn't mean he has to, going on. He has to so, go that route, does it? Uh, yeah, I think it was really a, like a message to the people, not only by saying the names, but he, to also to show people and show the Egyptian people that he knows what's been uh, going on uh, maybe behind the scenes, because most people say that Porsi is a very kind man, he doesn't know what's going on, so he's giving an example that he knows everything, and I, I think he also mentioned by mentioning names and mentioning names of the uh, corrupt all over Egypt and some family names and where are they, so it's a kind of hint and this kind of indication that he wants to tell the people that he knows everything and he knows the details and he knows the names and he's got names because he, if he said that I just know the names and that's it, people say, oh, just he doesn't know, but okay. he knows everything. Okay. And, I, and I think it was very meaningful. Let's pick up on the mixed messages Angus was saying that he brought up in his speech as far as the economy is concerned. Do you have an economic policy that you can discuss with the president and is there a, a clear message on how the economy is, is going to be driven by the government? Of course, of course. So, but he actually, you know, that over the past one year, we had a lot of uh, discussions, and also we have an economic uh, policy. Uh, I, either at, uh, in the party we have, we have an economic committee, and I think so on the presidency as well. But now we are talking something very much uh, 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 different from what we are talking about economy now. The atmosphere now, the situation in Egypt should be secure at the very beginning. We have some priorities like security first and trying to secure the atmosphere where, where an, any economy, not Egyptian one, can work well and properly. So I think it's part and parcel from that. What's going on is that to talk about security or talking about economy at the same time. I mean, no economy can flourish in such an environment where you have 22 or 24 uh, million man march during one year and you have more than 7,000 protests. Uh, professional protest uh, over this past year. You have people and thugs uh, all over the country. We have to secure the country and simultaneously, of course, we are trying to push for the economy. As you heard yesterday, we had a one million uh, tourists extra this year, So, because, but actually media is not talking about this at all. They always show the dark yeah, side I mean, of I mean, some are saying so. that uh, those figures are not correct. Angus, uh, it's pretty bad, isn't it, on the streets? I mean, factories have closed. Uh, people are wondering where they're going to get their next meal from. There's very little investment. Well, you've got to remember, there are very many long-term issues and where we've got to give, forgive a little in terms of anybody being in government. Egypt is not an easy country to run and anybody coming into governance would have had a tough time. But in the end, it comes down to competencies and ideas. And can someone come up with ideas and a plan that would help to change sentiment? Because in the end, when something changes, the change happens in your head. It doesn't happen just in terms of numbers. You change sentiment. Now, if you actually look at Egypt, Egypt's economic crisis from 1999 to 2004 was actually worse than it is now. Uh, very significant problems with high government debt, high private sector debt, the majority of which was in foreign currency. And the previous government uh, made one very good change, and that was it cut corporate and personal tax rates in half to 20%. Instantly, sentiment changed. Now, Following the uprising, there have been a variety of changes of government and five different fina uh, finance ministers, for example, from the uprising. That kind of change uh, doesn't help. You need some more continuity. But more than anything else, you need some ideas. But the long-term issues in Egypt, uh, long-term, higher than average, global average, inflation, particularly food price inflation. That is an issue that needs to be tackled because it is unsustainable that in a poor country, and Egypt's a relatively poor country, GDP per capita around $3,000 per annum, 
uh, high, it's like a tax on the poor particularly. So you need to bring, bring down inflation, currently running between 10 and 11% per annum, down. You need to bring down food price inflation, currently running in the mid-teens, uh, and it, that's really hurting. You've got to look at the long-term trade deficit, which needs to be funded, and the current account deficit, which historically has been put into surplus by, by very strong foreign direct investment, particularly in the oil and gas sector. And over the last 15 years, very significant investment into other forms of investment into manufacturing. And even since the uprising, there's still a lot of people who are very hopeful about Egypt, even the other day, a company buying into the food sector. But you need to, at the top, and it's like, imagine Egypt like a company. If you have a chairman or CEO who is, doesn't have a strategy, who's saying unusual things, it doesn't exactly bring confidence. And if you have a government which, uh, when people are feeling bad, raises taxes, you're not going to feel better. So if I recommend anything, it's you've got to, first of all, give people dignity by providing the right conditions for the economy to grow. And you need to triple current economic growth, get it up above 6% so that it can begin to trickle down onto the street 6% 6 per, 6 per annum. You need to bring down inflation. You need to increase food production in Egypt and cut wastage. The World Bank estimates around half of all food is wasted in Egypt. So there are a variety of things that need to be done to show that people that something is changing. And okay. if, we, if we actually look over the last year, I would say actually some things have gotten worse and really no one's getting the issue of can we have a new good vision for Egypt? Can you have a good economic plan that stimulates growth that, so that people can have jobs and have some more dign dignity again? Okay, those seem to be fair enough suggestions. At, at the same time as this uh, so economic problems facing the country, there's also deteriorating domestic security. The number of homicides has tripled since 2011. Kidnappings for ransom rose from 107 in 2010 to 412 in 2012. Armed robberies are up from 233 in 2010 to more than 2,800 last year. And the fear from all of this is giving rise to so-called mob murders and vigilante justice. Nada, what do you put that down to? <clears throat> Over the past year, I mean, if we are talking about what's gone on over the past year, first year of President Morsi's term, uh, security was uh, slightly better than the uh, year before that uh, since the revolution. But of course, it's not up to the people's uh, aspirations. So what we are trying now, and what I think the conclusion of what President Morsi said yesterday, but that we are improving, but not we are improving enough for the people to be pleased or to be happy, but we are improving. And the only way is to people to be patient. And we are trying to solve uh, problems which has been there for 60 years. So it's, I mean, it's impossible. It's not logic to say that we can solve all these problems completely in one year. So what we are trying to do and what we, I mean, as a presidency or as a party or the, as a regime, is trying to solve this problem uh, one by one in a democratic way and uh, in a uh, also legal way, so that's why it takes time. You don't want to I, go I back should imagine to you, you must be pretty concerned, or the government must be pretty concerned about the protests that have been called for. What will they starting uh, tomorrow, Friday, and uh, going to run through to June the 30th? What position is the army going to be taking on these protests? <clears throat> the position of the army yesterday, it was clear by the president, as I said, the army is just will never interfere in politics. Its mission is a holy one, and it should be uh, with the legitimacy all the time, and also for the sake of the people, of Egyptian people. Uh, this time, the army for the uh, next three or four days will slightly take part in security in the streets of Egypt, helping the police. But mainly, or generally, the, uh, the military will never interfere. So okay, that's you what, say that. I mean, Let me throw this to Angus. Uh, the head of the army did say that if there is violence, if there were to be violence, that they will intervene. I mean, that marks quite a dramatic shift. What do you think the army's message is? I think... It, first of all, it's, to some people, or many people, it's reassuring that the army has a limit. There's a red line against which then, uh, if it's crossed, they would intervene to stop the violence. The army, the military has said that it will be uh, position itself on key streets and key buildings. And I think the message is to say, look, have a peaceful demonstration. It is your right in a democracy to have a peaceful demonstration. 
But if you start attacking buildings, or if people start, anyone starts attacking buildings of the state, or any other buildings uh, that it, value, it views as being symbols of the state, uh, then it might intervene. Hopefully, I mean, it won't come to that. I mean, fear were saying that this could but be I, a prelude to a military coup. I mean, that's just pushing it too far, isn't it? No, I think partly this is where I think the opposition has made a mistake. And that is, if you want to hold mass demonstrations, the issue is then you hold the demonstration and then so what? What comes after? And you can't go to say to people then just the removal of the president. We, the whole goal of everybody, I assume, in the opposition too, as well as the people in government, the Muslim Brotherhood or the FGP, in terms of the president and the cabinet, is to have a democracy, hopefully. And therefore, you must participate. And I think that's where I think the weakness in the opposition is, uh, at least from an outsider's perspective. They should participate, plan better, and really participate on the ground to try to win, whether it's um, at a local level or a higher level, try to win seats in parliament. And I find that there's a significant disappointment amongst everyone I speak to, even if they're involved in the opposition, that there hasn't been enough planning to try to tackle uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in a political sense and it's the FJP, the political arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, to tackle it against um, in Parliament, for example. There's no unity, So that's disappointing. And the thing is... OK, let, let me just step back for a second, if you, uh, if you'll allow me. Mohamed Morsi won the presidential election by a narrow margin in June last year. He ran as a candidate for the Freedom and Justice Party. That's the political wing of the Muslim Brotherhood. In August, he set his sights on the military, dismissing his defence minister and stripping the military of any say in legislation. Then it was the economy seeking a $4.8 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund. Yet to be confirmed, in November, Morsi took on the judiciary, stripping judges of the right to challenge his decisions, only to back down in the face of mass protests. December, it was the Constitution. A draft is approved, boosting the role of Islam, backed by a public referendum, but drawing more opposition protests. And after a year... Politics and protests, Morsi appoints allies to key posts who want a greater role for Islam in politics. He accused the opposition of rejecting calls for national reconciliation. Nada, you can't accuse him of being a lazy man. He's, he's certainly been busy and has taken a pot shot at almost everybody. Uh, no, nobody can say Dr. Morsi is a lazy man. Dr. Morsi, I know that he is working, I mean, like something like 18 or 19 hours a day. So uh, what he said yesterday, to sum up all what we are saying for the uh, past year, Dr. Morsi is really trying to make a surgery to the body which was, I mean, hurt by the practice of uh, 60 years, but he doesn't want this body to die. So he's making it so accurate and so careful to take out these kind of diseases for the past 60 years. That's why some people say, think that he sometimes he's lazy, but he's not. He actually doesn't want to have, or, or he wants to have the least damages out of this surgery. Well, I'm going to stop you there for a minute and get some more reaction from the streets. This is what people have been sending to our Facebook page. Ahmed Bella Mahama tells us, Morsi must go. Egypt's problem isn't caused by any external enemies, but internal. Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood are the key masterminders of the problems in Egypt. And Shiraz Gul Wahid says one year is enough for any true leader, so people are demanding change at the right time. Issa Kabildo disagrees, saying, let's just say Rome wasn't built in a day, so they shouldn't expect an immediate change for a leader who's been on duty for just a year. And Mohammed Yakut Soy Sobi adds, these people who are demanding the resignation of the president are going too far. It takes time for the country to rebuild its economy, infrastructure, health, education and wealth. Angus, briefly, if you will, where do you see Egypt now? What needs to be done? Well, first of all, I think all of the problems are surmountable. They're not going to be easy, and that's where I would agree with Nader. There are long-term structural issues, some of which I mentioned earlier. The key issue is you need competent decision makers. People can work hard, but if they're not the best people for the jobs, they're not going to do the job well. Neither can they give people confidence, the citizens' confidence, that the right people are in place. So first of all, put the right decision makers of competence in the right place. Make sure I think the president came in on a platform of being inclusive. Well, let's see more examples of that by bringing in other people. The problem is, though, the opposition don't want to work with him now. He's divided people over the, over the last year. OK, let's but leave it there. Angus Blair, we sadly run out of time. And thank you.
Angus Blair, Nader Omran, and also to Marwa El Khadi, who joined us a little earlier on the phone. You know by now, probably you can find this program many more at aljazeera.com. Thanks for watching. Goodbye for now.